They never mentioned it. Hey, Bisa, how are you? I'm good. How are you, Melvin? I'm doing well. It is Thursday. We're one day closer. I'm one day closer. <laughs> if you don't work on the weekends. <laughs> no, I don't. Well, I mean, it, it, if something goes on and my phone rings, but I'm sure not like you. Yeah. How are things in Richmond? They're good for the most part. Weather looks pretty nice. It's it's windy. It's a little windier out here than I thought. I might have to go inside. Oh. Lisa, please don't let Melvin convince you that he's doing any work Sunday through Saturday. <laughs> what do you mean Sunday through Saturday? That's the entire That's week. Not all. That's the whole week. <laughs>
How you doing, Dante? Hello, Chief. How's it going? It's going. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that's a happy Thursday. Happy Thursday. Monday was a holiday for us, so okay. it's been a short week, but it'll be a long week because I'll work on the weekend. <laughs> Man, well, you know, uh, the butt stops there, so <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. that's how it goes. <laughs> I'm not complaining. I'm just <laughs> stating the facts. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Hey, Chris, how are you? Pretty good. How's everyone? Good. Thank you. <laughs> it looks Hello, like the COVID grooming standards going on, Chris. Okay, so I'm just going to point out to everyone, you know, that in certain directions, that's cool, you know what I mean? Certain people we probably can't get away with, you know, saying things like that. It's cool, though. It's cool. <laughs> I see, I see what you're doing. <laughs> Well, so we do have grooming standards in the police department, but because of COVID, we've let them, you know, mm -hmm. go by the wayside. So now I see guys with long hair. We already allowed the beards. That was something that we started allowing a year or two ago. So, but it's just different seeing people not um, clean cut, clean shaven, mm -hmm. which is a good thing. I mean, cause we're, it's, you know, letting people be people. Indeed. Yeah, I, you know, it's funny. I, I've had the beard, like it hadn't been like maybe this high, but I've had like a, you know, basically this amount of hair on my face for a while. But, you know, because it's not getting lined up, like it's way more of a, people like, oh, you letting your beard grow. I'm like, no, look at some old pictures. Like it's been there for a minute. Um, <laughs> it's way more of a thing. You just don't have that, you don't have the crisp line now. That's all it is, I, right? I do not. I do not, and I am scared to try it myself. So this is this is what it is until I feel safe to to walk back into a barbershop. It's right now. It doesn't seem worth taking too many risks for it. It's fine, but I, I'm looking forward to the day that I feel comfortable. And even you know, wearing a mask, right? Like which you would have to wear in a barbershop. You can't get at this if I have a mask on. So there's not really a point. Well, I know it's a little after three, but I don't think we have a quorum yet. Let's see here. I see Cheryl just logged on. Good afternoon, Hola. Cheryl. Hola. Monica, how many how many do we have now? Can't hear you, Monica. Or I can't, at least. I, don't know. I thought I unmute. Um, yeah, anyway, it didn't work. <laughs> First try. So we have three now on the call. Uh, we need one more member to have a quorum. And uh, Rob Lopetsky said she won't be here today. So uh, if Stephanie or Dinah or Tamisha joins us, then we have a quorum. If not, oh, Tamisha has joined us. So we <laughs> There, it's Misha. Can you hear us, Tamisha? Yeah, can you hear me? Oh, now we can. All right, so you joining just made a quorum, so thank you. I guess we could wait one more minute to see if um, Dinah or Stephanie logs on.
All right, we got Stephanie on here and it's 3.05. So we'll get started. Um, we can go around and introduce ourselves. I see a couple of names that I'm not sure have been on here before. So my name is Bisa French and I um, represent the county chiefs on the racial justice oversight body. And Melvin. Uh, Melvin Russell, the assistant chief of uh, probation. Uh, I'll kick it over to Dante. Hello, everybody. Dante Blue. I'm with the Office of Reentry and Justice here in the Probation Department. Um, we'll go to Chris James. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Chris James. I'm a site manager with the W. Haywood Burns Institute, which is is a national nonprofit based in Oakland uh, doing work to transform justice systems around uh, the concept of racial equity. Uh, and I will pass to Monica. Uh, I'm Monica Carlisle. I'm the senior program analyst with the Office of Reentry and Justice. Um, Lynette. Lynette Williams, Stand Together Contra Costa from the Public Defender's Office. Um, Jill? Hi there, Jill Ray with Supervisor Candace Anderson's office. Cheryl, do you wanna go? Yes, ma'am. Cheryl Sayed, it's Racial Justice uh, Coalition. And I will pass it to Miss Stephanie. Hi, everyone. Stephanie Medley with the RISE Center, and I'll pass it to Ed. Good afternoon, everyone. Ed Randall, Director of Field Service Probation. And I will let's see what I see on the screen. I will pass it to Miss Malkia Crowder. I see the square, but I don't see or hear the person. So what about Chris Wickler? Hi everyone, uh, Chris Wickler with the Office of Supervisor Karen Mitchoff. And then I will pass it over to Tamisha. Is she gone? Tamisha Walker, Antioch resident, member of the Racial Justice Over. Look, it's too long. I'm a member <laughs> and the director of Safe Return Project. And did, did Ms. Crowder go already? She's having computer uh, oh, difficulties okay. right now. Um, I think that's the last one. Oh, cool. Uh, DA Becton. Good afternoon, everyone. Dinah Becton here, um, district attorney, um, member of the Racial Justice Oversight Board. Oh, um, anybody who hasn't gone yet? Anybody, anybody? Okay. All right, thank you. I think we got everybody besides Ms. Crowder. Um, so we'll move on. Public comment. Any public comment? All right. Not hearing any, we'll move to item three, which is approve the record of actions from the September 17th meeting. And I hope everyone had a chance to go over the meeting minutes. Is there I'll entertain a motion to accept the minutes or approve the record of actions. Anyone, anyone want to move? So move, Dinah, speaking. Thank you. Is there a second? Yes, I'll second. Thank you, Cheryl. And, and I can do a roll call. For the committee, um, Bisa French. Yeah. Dinah Becton. Yes. Stephanie Metley. Yes. Melvin Russell. Yes. 
Cheryl Sadas? Yes. Tamisha Walker? Yes. Motion carries unanimously. All right, that was easy. Um, the next item is to, this, to consider the subcommittee's definition of diversion. And we talked about this at the last meeting and we actually um, put together a new definition that people wanted to digest and kind of go over before we accepted. So um, it is attachment two, which I'm pulling up. Has everybody had a chance to look it over or should we read it together? How do you guys want to? Um, My start starts on page seven. I was, just saying, I was just saying it starts on page seven. Okay. Uh, at attachment. So on page seven, it goes over the referral history and um, we got a lot of good input last month on what we kind of wanted it to say and then the objectives that we thought should be under there. And so starting on page eight, I think is kind of what we ended up with last month. So I'll open it up for discussion. Is there anything that you guys are feel you feel is missing from it? Um, anything that we should be adding additionally? Is this something that we're ready to vote on? You want me to read it? I'll open it up for discussion. Um, I'm trying to find the who's is it Monica who sent out the yes. Link? Oh, I could find it. Actually, Dante, I think, sent it out. Oh, Dante. Okay, let me search his name. Okay. Well, I'll read what the definition is. It says diversion is defined as an array of formal and informal practices that results in an individual who has been accused of a crime being directed to supportive services, education, restorative justice programs, or other data-driven or innovative methods of rehabilitation as an alternative to prosecution and or incarceration. And then there's eight different objectives and standards that should be included in these diversion programs or these programs. So I think we should probably just start with the definition do we think that it encompasses everything that we want it to encompass? I'm looking for a page. Hmm. Hmm. Um, I think for me, um, I think this with the bullet points, it kind of covers everything that we talked about that we discussed at the last meeting. Okay. Anyone else? Uh, yeah, and I just I just sent you over the link if you weren't able to find it. So if you check mm -hmm. your email I have it. Thank you, Dante. Right. Um, I, I, I agree with Stephanie. This is Donna. Okay. I, I would just add, um, so as you guys may remember from last month, uh, Dante and myself, based on the things that we said, we're working on what you see in front of you now. And one of the things that, uh, well, I guess there are two things that came up that I want to highlight uh, and throw to you all. Uh, but I'll start with the first one, which is, um, so originally I, I had tried to include some language and you guys can decide if you think this is worthwhile to include. Um, basically stating that, um, that diversion programs should be used um, essentially when, when necessary right as opposed to if something is such a minor offense that it really doesn't make sense to have a person commit to a program for a you know 30 days or whoever knows uh who, who knows how long 
um, if it's if it's something that can be dealt with, say, with a warning release or citing release or something like that, that we still want to, um, you know, have have that option highlighted for people, um, just so that it, you're not overusing it in a way that, of course, widens the net, right? Like creates more opportunities for somebody to not make it to a class or to, you know, not successfully complete a program and to go into the system for something that probably could have been help um, dealt with, you know, much, much sooner with something much less involved. Um, so that was just some language that I had in there that um, is missing in this draft. Um, and something I would throw out to you guys um, to discuss whether or not you think it's worth spelling out such a thing. Chris, so Chris you had it in another draft? It's not all the way missing, Chris. It's, uh, it's there in um, number three the second part of it, right? Which, so it should maximize access without expanding the reach of our justice system, right? Uh, so we didn't want to net widen, but, but, but I, what I hear you saying that you want to be more specific, um, uh, call that out a little more clearly. I mean, do we want to actually use the language net widening? Um, so I, I don't have strong feelings about, um, you know, using those words in particular. I think, um, just as Dante said, perhaps being a little bit more clear and you probably don't need the words net widen or some people may not even know what that means. People who might, uh, look at this or use this as a guideline, which is the second thing that I want to bring up that we, that we talked about while we were drafting, right? Where is this going to go? How is it going to be? be used to hold uh, uh, expanding um, without unnecessarily oh but uh but yeah the question the question is maybe you want to say something like um you know it should be used when appropriate uh if less um i don't know some some what? language around if less punitive measures or if, if less uh prolonged uh uh, um, interventions are, are applicable to use those instead, just just to make sure it's there on the page. Um, because otherwise, you know, if you're not spelling that out and that's something that needs to be hashed out later or you see like a trend happening with diversion where it's like, oh, you know, there was a, uh, you know, a kid was loitering and got, you know, referred to this program yeah. and has to do, you know, 30 days before they can, you know, avoid whatever was coming next, you know, that would be, that would be an overuse of it. Um, but it's up to you guys to determine whether or not you think that's relevant to spell out. Just wanted to highlight mm -hmm. it for you. In case. Mm -hmm. I think it's worth considering. This is Dinah. I wondered if, um, and this may or may not work, but that same paragraph without unnecessarily expanding the reach does that work? A diversion should be used only when appropriate other appropriate alternatives are. Yeah, I think that's that's along the line of what I was whatever whatever the rest of that sentence was going to be that you were going to say. That's what I was trying. To, <laughs> that's what I was trying to come up with. It sounds sounds right. Maybe that's the opening clause. There, it should only be used when appropriate so that um, you maximize access to diversion without, you know, expanding. Maybe you open up with that, put that at the front though, whatever you're talking about, Chris, kind of as a opening piece somehow potentially. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm open to it. I, I'm hearing like between you and DA Beckton, I'm hearing the language coming together better than what I can articulate right now. So if we can, if we can capture those thoughts and make sure they make it into this, I think that'll, that'll cover it. 
So really, it's just taking number three and putting it up into the actual definition. Yep, with just a little bit more specific yeah. language. Yeah, that would be fine if it actually uses the words uh, keeping the person out of the criminal justice system, to me. Maybe just use the plain English words, right? That the purpose of it is to keep the defendant out of the criminal justice system by having them complete these type of programs. Because isn't that the whole purpose? I think what what my uh, what I'm understanding Chris to say is that um, having language specifically saying like if that young person um, does it actually need to be put into a diversion program um, and not over programming a young person that we should explicitly say that yes so I'm that it's that, not they're not yeah. even getting put into the system. I'm saying that too, but I'm also saying that it still doesn't say diversion. Um, pro it doesn't use the language that I'm saying is that the purpose of the diversion, it doesn't use the plain English words that the purpose of the diversion, that, that of diversion is to keep the, 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 the person accused of a crime out of the criminal justice system by either having them complete the program if it's appropriate for them to even be in a program, which is what I believe the point was, right? So if it's appropriate for them, if it's not appropriate for them to be in a program because it's some minor offense, then don't put them through the program. But if it is, a, but the purpose of diversion is to keep them out of a criminal justice system. And even though I understand what without expanding the reach of our criminal, our local legal system means, how many other people understand what that really means? Can we just say it in plain English? Keeping Sorry. someone out of the criminal justice system so that people who are not involved in this type of work understands what that means? So I think that that's kind of at the end of the um, diversion defined, it says as an alternative to prosecution or incarceration and maybe a way um, to have that simple language that you're talking about, Cheryl, could be as an alternative to entering the criminal justice system. Um, that would be there, but I still hear what um, Chris is talking about is not casting. So I think we're talking about two different things not casting a wider net to capture more people and so i think with number three if we initially um uh, suggested putting a word between without and expanding i can't remember what that word was but it kind of necessarily unnecessarily expanding the um the reach might actually help with that language too, unless you need to think that language yeah. needs to be less than that. I think the word was, it would appropriate is, I think this, I think Stephanie just said it too. Because yeah. if there's no, I, I like the, uh, the not necessarily expanding the reach, but I think that it's, if it's not appropriate to, 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 to put them in a program because you know, the offense is so minor, then why are we putting them through the program? So maybe we talk about being relative to the, relative to the crime or thing, relative to you know, making sure that the program is relative to the crime. I, that's probably not the best wording either. The offense. The offense. And, and their background, right? Because I, I think that sometimes it's always a punitive uh, measure. The first, the first reaction is something very punitive rather than finding another way to handle the situation. And I think that this is what, uh, what I got out of what uh, Sir Christopher was referring to. So Chris, in our initial document, did you have some more specific language that um, was taken out? Not, not in the original document. So when Dante and I went into a, a, a draft, um, 
uh, when we went back to draft this, like we said we would when we, uh, you know, after we heard everybody's thoughts last meeting. Um, and, it, and I don't think that wording was perfect either. Like, I, I, again, I've heard things since we've been talking that sound better than what I was. I was trying to say it. Um, I was just struggling to find the words to get it out there. Um, so I, something like something along the lines of trying to remember the things that I've heard uh, today, like, uh, that diversion should not be used when a, uh, a less stringent uh, or a, a, a less um, severe, although it's not like diversion is the most severe thing, it's hard to define that word, but like when a, when a, when a, when something of a, a, of a lesser capacity or lesser sort of time commitment and expectation can be used um, in place of diversion, um, that lesser thing should be used essentially is what I'm trying to say. Um, and again, between D.A. Becton and, and, and Dante and Stephanie, I think I heard better language than I'm able to come up with right now. But that's the point. And just making sure that it's there um, so that it's something which again goes back to another point about this that we need to talk about. Wherever this lives, like we 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 don't want people to. You don't want if you were if we're taking the amount of time that we're taking, um, which I don't have a problem with at all. I think it's you know good to to go through this, but you don't want a person to be within the guidelines uh, and and be having an unintended consequence, right? You want to try to write those out. Um, so that that's my thought. Okay, so what about still using number three, but um, just adding another sentence that says diversion shouldn't be the replacement of um, lesser opportunities or um, diversion shouldn't, shouldn't replace. Mm, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Yeah, because less severe is what keeps coming is to mind for me. Burden, uh, potentially, I don't know. Um, I, but I mean, as far as I'm concerned, and I'm not hearing, and I'm not trying to take over, obviously, you guys are the body, right? I, I'm not. Uh, but based on what I'm hearing so far, I think if we, if folks think it's worthwhile to, to include that language mm -hmm. after that, we, we may be ready to, you know, accept and, and, mm -hmm. and vote on this. It doesn't sound like there's a lot of contention with the rest of it. What if we hey, added, I'm, oh. I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry, you go ahead. What if we added uh, diversion should be proportionate to the offense? Will that kind of capture what we're talking about? Or do you? Mm -hmm. Lisa, if I could add something, Chief, mm -hmm. it seems to me that, and, and shoot me down if I'm wrong, you all, but it seems to me that what we're really trying to get at is this whole issue of sometimes over-supervising people, that some sort of a program or some sort of due supervision is not always appropriate and can sometimes be more harmful than, than helpful. And so it, it seems like that third, let me try to get back to that third sentence here. The third, third sentence, which was about, um, um, I guess it, I had to switch between screens, I'm sorry. Uh, eligibility requirements should operate to maximize mm -hmm access to diversion without expanding yes. the reach of our local legal mm -hmm. well so what i was thinking is is about um that first part of the sentence which which i think is the is the, is really great maximizing the opportunities while mindful um while mindful of not unnecessarily overburdening our legal justice system or something like that because it, it really is a mind uh, that we want to be mindful that we're not create, doing more harm than good to an individual. I think that's what we're trying to do, but that's not that that's the right words to say in this instance, but I think that's what the goal that we're trying to get to. 
Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's hard for, I know it's hard for me to like think on the spot with stuff yeah. like this. Um, but I do think it's two different things that we're talking about. I do agree though with Cheryl, I get the, the point of being, um, like maybe more explicit and having plain language around we're trying to keep people out of the criminal system. Um, so maybe we can change that language a little bit. Um, I think I would, I don't necessarily want to say unnecessarily burdening the criminal, the system, because to me that kind of takes a, a human element out of it. Um, but I'm wondering if it could be like unnecessary, I don't know, somehow we're saying that we're not expanding the pathways into the system, but it's still yeah, hard it for me to really. So, 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 you know, so maybe I offer two things, you know, um, one, you know, if you would like, you can pull this one out you know, approve, uh, and, and maybe we can try to bring something back and people can come back and we can insert this one in where people can kind of think on their own. Because as you said, it's always hard to, to think in the moment, right, when you're wordsmithing. Um, but, you know, just hearing what you just said, Stephanie, I think that, you know, maybe there is a, a and what Bisa said earlier, maybe there's just a whole nother sentence where, you know, um, to uh, Cheryl's point, where you say diversion, uh, the point of diversion is to, uh, you know, direct people away from the justice system. So therefore you need to be careful not to, you know, to include people that you otherwise wouldn't, right? And that'd be a whole nother idea separate from this, from this third, from number three, potentially. And it might capture, um, I think what we're trying to say, <clears throat> potentially. But, but yeah, it's definitely hard to wordsmith uh, on the fly, so. Yeah. Just yeah. my last um, I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say, I'm sorry to be bringing this back. I'm sure we all were expecting to be done with this. Uh, just want to make sure, again, that you have things down on paper the way that you want them to be. Um, and, and we'll talk um, in a little while about where this should go and how, how it's going to be used to hold the system accountable for doing what we're outlining. I, I agree. I, I think I just, um, uh, thank you. Uh, and I, I'm going to think about it. I, I think just my, my biggest concern is this whole notion of social control over every aspect of young people who might make a minor mistake or make a mistake that should not be in you know, so, such a narrow frame. And even though I don't like every the overuse of words like restorative justice, there are some restorative processes that we can use that don't necessarily involve courts and custody in this overuse of social control. So I think that maybe um, Dante's uh, suggestion about a different sentence that focuses on, on you know, uh, talking about um, not a, maybe that type of expansion, a restorative process that does not concentrate on putting people in this criminal justice system, but uses this plain language though, talking about not putting people in the criminal justice system, but maybe using restorative processes that does not emphasize social control is uh, something that I'll, I'll need to ruminate on it, but I think it's something that could, could work in conjunction with number three that um, D.A. Beckton was, was talking about. So that's the only way I can see that we, we can eliminate that whole net widening conversation. Okay, I actually liked um, the words that Stephanie used when she said without expanding the pathways into the system. I thought that that kind of mm -hmm. uh, yeah. was what we were trying to get to. Um, but if people feel like they want to still kind of work on the wording, is there maybe 
two people that want to get together and work on the wording so that next month when we come back together, we can get something to, we have something with the wording that we're talking about today to finalize. And maybe it, and maybe we should look out at the rest of the document to see if there's any other wording that we might want to change. I think Stephanie's idea was perfect, actually. Yeah, I go for Stephanie too. It's 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 voting season, so I like Stephanie. <laughs> Happy to work on the language with someone. I don't know who the someone is, but whoever it is. Any other volunteer to work with Stephanie on the language? One probably hour long meeting will probably be able to hash it out. <laughs> All right, Stephanie, I guess it's me and you. If you need me, you can call me. If I don't pick up the phone, it's not my fault. <laughs> okay. All right, um, then Stephanie and I will get together before the next meeting and, and try to work on some language to bring back for next month. I'll, I'll send the both of you um, this language in the email so that you have it. Uh, so you don't have to, so you can manipulate it how you like. Okay, thank you. All right, so we won't be voting um, as on number four, but I, I guess I should open it up for public comment. There's any public comment on the language? Anybody want to help us out? No. I'll, I'll just I'll just uh, ask if it's worthwhile at this point to talk about how this language is going to be used, where it's going to live, who's going to do what with it, um, so that all the work that you're putting in means something in terms of how diversion decisions are made, uh, or if you guys would rather table it to the next meeting when hopefully the definitions are all finalized. Well, maybe it is important to discuss how this is going to be used because that might um, also inform how we finalize the definition. Right, agree. Anybody have thoughts about you know, why are we coming up with this definition and how it's going to be used? My thought is that we're going to be using this as we come up with recommendations. We're going to be looking to make, making sure that the recommendations that we come up with for diversion programs are, follow our definition and, and the objectives. I, I think it could be broader as well because a number of other entities might also be struggling. Like, for example, I was in the meeting, I think it's the, somebody helped me with the acronyms, JJC subcommittee on, um, and, and that subcommittee was also struggling to come up with a definition. So perhaps this is gonna be a very comprehensive and thorough definition, and perhaps it's something that others could adopt as well as they're formulating their thinking around diversion programs as well. Yeah, I agree. I think as we're um, we're kind of moving forward, I see there's we're trying to coordinate more with the different um, bodies around the county, and so this could be. And there are several of the bodies have diversion subcommittees, and so this could be um, a good guideline for them. Also, I think. And I guess this comes in with the language and making sure that we do have plain language. Um, how are we communicating this definition to the community um, so that they also understand um, what diversion means for the county and can also help with their advocacy efforts. Yeah, I think that all sounds right on target. Um, I would say in addition to that, uh, referring 
um, agencies or relevant agencies in the process of uh, referring you to diversion um, and, and the like. Um, if, if there's a way to directly engage those those agencies and or have those agencies adopt um, this language um, and and I don't know potentially post it in their in their buildings in their offices or at their desks so that people kind of have a sense of you know going down the list and saying okay is this do, do all these things apply before I make this decision uh, would also be pretty pretty powerful but from a practical standpoint I also think the definition is good so that we're all speaking the same language because many times when people say diversion you know it means different things to different people and so I think at the very beginning of this subcommittee I think that that was like the number one thing so that we were all like on the same page and not only those people on the subcommittee but also um, on the um, oversight body period because this this definition was also going to be provided to like the the community uh, the other subcommittees right so that everybody was 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 speaking the same the same time I would also say that, um, you know, to that point, all speaking the, the same language, I think it'd be, <clears throat> it'd be great to have as an objective and end goal um, as, you know, for our departments to endorse and adopt and, you know, uh, have this as part of their, you know, official policies. You know, this is what diversion is and this is what drives um, their decisions around diversion. Because I think, you know, that's where the rubber hits the road, right, is that, you know, as we're looking for, um, ways to respond um, differently, uh, what are we going to be guided by? So, um, you know, this is a, you know, interesting um, committee in the fact that, you know, we have leadership from um, probation, public defender, district attorney, you know, all in, in one place to where there can be some type of shared agreement um, about what we're trying to do. I think that'd be um, kind of pushing it a little further. But also think too, you have to look at the, the entry point of where it all starts. And uh, that's with local law enforcement. When, you know, the, if Richmond PD makes a contact of a youth uh, in the community and determining, hey, what, what charge, you know, what did, what did they do? And is this something that, hey, we can just send over and divert? Right, what definition, what what policies are they gonna have in place? And then, you know, the, the next the next step in it then becomes the district attorney of de deciding if they are going to file charges. Uh, or if it's something where, hey, nope, that's coming over, we're going to divert. Uh, and so I totally agree that, you know, we're all gonna have to have the same definitions uh, across all the agencies. I, you know, having probation, the DA and Richmond PD here, um, it'd be interesting to see how other local law enforcement agencies will, will look at this definition too and how they'll incorporate it in their policies or not. Hey. Monica, did you have something? Or? Oh, I was just going to say maybe we can uh, present this definition to the full RJOB at the uh, upcoming quarterly meeting. So potentially it'll reach more audience and we can um, even discuss further on, as far as, you know, how to get this out there for all the agencies and partners. And I see that we have a, a comment from a public member in the chat box as well. And Stephanie, would you like to elaborate on um, the JJC's effort to respond to SB 823 as suggested in the chat? Oh, I think actually Stephanie um, stepped away. So maybe we'll, we'll follow up on that uh, when she returns. I think she just said she'll be right back. Yeah. Monica, when is the next quarterly meeting? Does this, does this body meet again before they do? Or? No, the next quarterly meeting is on November 5th. So, yeah, so yeah. So this body meeting. We won't have our definition finalized by then. 
That's right. <laughs> Okay, any more discussion on the definition and objectives and uh, Stephanie's returned? I, I know that there was this question for you, Stephanie, in the chat. If you have time to review that and maybe answer. Um, yes, so yes, for DJJ. Um, JJCC will be forming a subcommittee that will specifically be looking at um, the DJJ closure and how the county will be handling that. Um, over the next, the goal is, and we just briefly kind of discussed this yesterday, but the goal is to have um, like an initial plan by March, so um, we can be ready for um, budgets. And we'll probably start meeting, if not next, next month, early December, and probably be meeting bi-weekly. That's about all I know right now. Okay. Is there anything else before we move on to the next item? Okay. Um, the next item is to discuss the development of our, the subcommittee's list of local diversion options with the collection of further information. And I know I failed on my part to provide the information I was supposed to provide in a timely manner. I do have it now. Um, we'll get to the programs that we were waiting on information from. I don't know if we received information from the others, Dante or Monica. Yeah, so um, I actually dropped the ball myself. Um, uh, most of the stuff that we were supposed to, um, most of the things that we received, I put in here, I, we did miss um, one document. Uh, DA Becton sent us a, um, her uh, filing standards. Um, and I don't know how I just missed the document that came in. And, but when I saw it, we had already sent the agenda off, so we didn't disturb it. Um, so, so we'll make sure that gets included. But Everything else that, that um, we received, we put in here, there were, uh, we included probations document that they shared last month as part of the informal probation. Um, we, were, we were asked to um, kind of consolidate mental health um, diversion and I think behavioral health, diver no, uh, mental health diversion in AB 1810. And so we consolidated that and you know, also just provided a, a PowerPoint from Judicial Council that kind of gives some background about just the ABA 1010. Um, ORJ also was to uh, provide some information on veterans court and military diversion. And so uh, so probably half the packet is that. <laughs> uh, they had the, the court provided some pretty robust information in terms of manuals and policies and procedures and um, uh, that dealt with both of those and kind of, you know, what was military diversion what was Veterans Court. It's worth saying though that the Veterans Court doesn't exist in name anymore. I, I think that the uh, potentially what's happening is that um, on that same docket, they're still doing some of what's in, in the document, but they, they was funded by a grant and that grant's gone away. So um, in terms of being able to kind of fund some of the positions that were part of the, the team there, um, I'm not sure what, what they have now. Um, the last thing was um, we did receive a, um, there's a uh, presentation, PowerPoint presentation here from the district attorney's office that uh, talks about um, Restore, which is the project, 
the restorative justice project between the DA's office and um, RISE um, and Impact Justice. So, um, so all that information is in there. We, we included them as appendix, appendices, if you will. Um, so I think there were maybe four altogether, but we also, I think the group asked us to put the list um, in a in a order that instead of before we had it youth and adults split out and then regional east west central uh, by service and so the, um, the direction was you know we wanted to see it more so in um, decision points so thinking about you know what are the different points of intervention and so what we uh, provided to the to the body is this created this chart on page 18 16 16 sorry so small page 16 um, of, of your of your packet which really tried to um, classify it classify the justice process in kind of these three big buckets if you will so first being custody and detention um, then you uh, then the beginning of the legal processing so kind of starting with the filing and going through the entire court process and then if you know ultimately um, reaching adjudication or um, conviction, then there's going to be, you know, the, the judgment that comes out the sentence and kind of enforcing that sentence, whether it's custody or um, some type of um, community supervision. So putting them into those three buckets, we try to use this chart to, to show uh, these spheres of influence, right? So really, you know, who, who has the ability to, to really make decisions where? Um, and, you know, one thing I would say is for the Office of the District Attorney, that probably stretches a little bit before that second box you know if, if i were to do it again i probably would bring it out a little bit more because truthfully um that box really if it starts with filing you know the hopes are that um something can happen before filing actually occurs right and not and not really at filing so so i think that this tries to to um to create those three buckets and then how we did the list is we then put the um the programs in one of those three in either stage a stage b or stage c um, one, two, or three. I um, mean, really interestingly, um, most of the, I think all the, the youth programs are pretty much stage A, more or less. Um, and um, I think most of the adults were, uh, you know, at that second stage, stage B. Um, I'm not sure, I, I don't think there were any that kind of seemed to flow over. I mean, we can clean it up and, you know, whether the group even likes this framework or not. Um, uh, we can kind of discuss that and, and go back and revisit it if it's necessary. But, but essentially, that's what you have in front of you. You have um, this uh, page 16 to kind of think about where those spheres of influence are um, and then using those buckets to organize um, the list as it was requested by this body. Okay. Um, there was the information that I was supposed to provide on um, a couple of things. Um, COPE Family Support Center, which I called and they said that they no longer have a diversion program or they, they don't have a diversion program. So I'm not sure who put this on here, but they're saying they don't have a diversion program. And the one that I wasn't able to reach, I left messages with the Mount Diablo Adult Education. So I'm not sure. Um, from what I read online, it seems like those are just, um, they don't seem like diversion programs. I think that they're, um, they're just uh, services that the school district has for these different classes. I don't know if anybody has additional information on that one though, but I haven't received a call back from anyone to tell me de um, definitively if they have diversion or not. Anyone know about Mount Diablo? I wonder if that was one, of, if that should be, um, you know, how, how that should be on this list. I, you know, I wonder if that was one of the ones, uh, thinking back from the earlier conversation where, um, as probation was thinking of how it would put together a, a potentially a diversion plan for somebody, um, maybe there were classes from uh, adult education, such as anger management or something else. Um, that would be included in that plan. And maybe that's how it got on the list. Um, I think that that's probably true. Um, and same thing with COPE because they have mentoring services and yeah. stuff like that. So I don't know if 
um, these were just organizations that diversion programs were referred to? Yeah, I think the, the original, when we put our list together is what, where do we send youth if we're trying to divert them from going further into the system? <laughs> uh regarding sending a, a referral over to the da's office and so cope probably was just put down as hey uh, uh, you need to um you need to complete anger management this is where we're where we're gonna send you or something but the anger management services at cope isn't necessarily that they, they're not saying oh. i mean Basically, still probation says if you complete it or not, not these different. Exactly. Yeah, all of our, so all of our stuff would be like that. So we, the, the referral would come in and before we make a decision on, hey, should we send this over to the DA, there may be organizations in the community that we've worked with in the past where we can send a youth over to complete whatever it would be uh, and then say, okay, you successfully completed two hours of whatever. Uh, so we'll go ahead and close out this referral uh, instead of sending it to the DA requesting that a petition be filed. And I don't know if they're talking about adult diversion, um, if the PD submitted something regarding COPE. So I think they, they submitted a bunch of adult stuff, I thought. Yeah, according to COPE, they don't have any diversion. So I don't know if that's most of I think most of the stuff from Robin was like statutory um, diversion, um, you know, mental health, military stuff like that. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, if, if if that's the case, then we're just definitely here to to take the input and see how, how you want to, um, and whether you want to remove that from the list if you want it to, you know, you know, be more centered somewhere else. Um, yeah. Let us know. Um, maybe, maybe we can have a separate. I think can either have a separate list with services that get referred to, um, but I don't think that it should actually be on the diversion list because they don't host a diversion program. Anybody else with input? I agree. Um, I think also because I think one of the things that we've talked about before is looking at how people are tracking data. And um, that would be hard to do if they're not running a specific program. I mean, but I do think it's good to know what services folks are being referred to. Yes, yeah, so maybe we have a separate services list. Um, and some people might be on both, like RISE, they provide services and they provide a diversion, um, but have a, a separate services list. Um, and I think probably the education department at Mount Diablo will probably fall under that also. Um, I could still wait and see if anybody ever calls me back. But um, just, again, what I read, it doesn't seem like they actually have a diversion program through the school district, and I kind of doubt that they do. Um, the other information I was supposed to come back with was um, relative to our, at the uh, our, our PAL um, diversion program, as well as the one that we um, do with RISE and the entry points um, were of misdemeanors. And this is the challenge too that, um, well, one of the recommendations I would say is there wasn't anything written down really. I mean, it's, um, what we do is we refer for misdemeanor cases that don't include guns or um, viol uh, serious violence, injury, serious injuries, um, and then we work with probation if it's going to be somebody that's already on probation. Typically, we'll, we'll contact probation first before we re, um, decide on diversion. Um, but there wasn't really a document. I guess I could type it up, but that's 
and even in the RISE documentation, our, our the uh, contract or MOU with RISE didn't spell it out either. I don't know, Stephanie, if you guys had anything additional besides the original MOU that we signed together. Yeah, and I mean, that original MOU was a while ago, too. 2013. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I do... Working off of faith. Uh-huh. Um, I do think, though, that even, um, even with your work with RPAL, um, even though you may not have anything formal, there may be some information that you all could probably find um, because they have the... Uh, the SDC grant. So there's certain criteria um, that falls under that. So that may be a way to get some of those data points that we may be looking for. Okay. And I forget I, who's the lead for that. I think Tamisha Safe Return is part of that project as well. Okay. <clears throat> So if, um, with that information, we've gone through all of the different programs. So I think we're at this point need to figure out what we, now that we have the information, what we actually do with the information. And that's where I probably need some help with from Chris, Dante, like, okay, we have it. Now what's our next steps to process the information? Are we looking for what works in each, um, you know, what we like out of each, each program or what we don't like? Like, what's the next step from here? Yeah, so um, somebody mentioned this before. Um, I think this is gonna depend on the extent to which we can get some level of data from these programs to figure out who's, who's completing and who's not. Um, mm -hmm. And also as the data subcommittee continues to work toward uh, getting more um, data from the various uh, decision points within the system, making sure that these programs are being used equitably, right? Like are there people who are slipping through the cracks who should be or could be di uh, diverted who are not, right? Like and who, who meet the eligibility criteria, but for some reason or another, that's not happening because from there, once we get a handle on, on those two questions, uh, you know, what we want to do per the work plan is start to make recommendations, right, about how um, these diversion programs should run. And that could be everything from, you know, uh, from a programmatic lens, from an el eligibility criteria lens, uh, um, you know, to the extent that there are in some of, in some of these uh, examples we have in the packet today, um, there's, talk about fees and or to, to some degree how fees are assessed and you know um it, it looks like at least on one of those programs there was like a sliding scale kind of um depending on a, a person's need or ability to to pay as determined by a judge um as this uh, referral is being made sort of thing so like these are all the kinds of these are the areas where you're going to want to make recommendations about uh, how to be more inclusive, how to be more equitable, how to make sure that everyone who has the, the everyone who should, given the criteria, have the chance to get into a diversion program does because that keeps, you know, as many people as possible out of the system. So what is the question to ask, uh, Chris, in terms of, um, you know, you, you know, this idea of, you know, you want to see who has data, you know, we're asking them for what data? Um, so I think for starters, I would be curious, um, you know, the extent to which they're tracking uh, people who successfully complete these programs as opposed to people who don't, um, and whether or not there's any information as to when folks don't, why they don't. Um, because there, there may be recommendations that need to be made in terms of, well, pre-COVID more, more likely, right? In terms of transportation, right? Somebody being able to get to a, a particular program location, um, you know, or how many, how many times they're being asked to come back to a particular place, 
because I can tell you from, you know, experience with just, you know, doing this, doing this work, thinking of say, uh, failures to appear, right. When people get, um, you know, detained for that, there are any number of, of, of things that lead up to that. And one of those can be like the number of hearings, right? Like how many times do I have to come to this program, especially if I'm a kid, right? Because depending on what age I am, I, I may not be the primary person responsible for getting me from point A to point B. So that, that could come into play. Um, so I would start with who's, who's, um, who's successfully completing the program and who isn't. And for those who aren't, who aren't what, reasons or what information do we have as to why they aren't and how does that how could that inform uh recommendations we might make um the the i think the other thing to to look at and i don't know that this is even possible i i, I mentioned uh fees and the assessment of fees um if there was some way to measure the extent to which that is uh a variable because that's that's specifically uh, laid out in the work plan as, as uh, something that we, we want to try to keep from happening is that people are barred uh, from even attending a program like this because they can't afford to pay. So in terms of collecting that information, um... Trying to think about what the easiest way to go about it. Maybe a, a standard letter from the group that we can send out to the organizations that we know are might be collecting the data and see if we could get it that way. Any other suggestions? I'm definitely open to that. And before folks get too discouraged uh, with stuff that I'm saying, uh, I just want to point out um, that it, 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 we may find, right, that one of the recommendations we need to make is that folks need to, uh, di diversion programs need to collect, you know, certain information. It, it may not go further than that because there may not be very much. Um, and if that's the case, then that's a big recommendation to come out of this group is we, we would, you know, ideally each program would, uh, would have information and, and share it uh, with groups like this about, um, you know, successes versus program uh, failures uh, and the reasons for it. But yeah, I think some sort of communication coming from this group to try to get a, a handle on that information is a, is a good place to start. Okay, so to get this rolling, is there anybody that wants to take a stab at, or is there support for somebody to help us to write a letter and um, send it out so that we can start collecting this information? So, so Mr. Oh, oh, no, no, I was just gonna ask, um, because I, I think I remember as doing something like this in, in the cap. So just wondering if there was like a template or something floating around in the universe of a letter. Not that I can think of. I mean, I can certainly look, but nothing, nothing is jumping out um, right now to me. Um, yeah, I can definitely look though. Uh, I would I would um, just throw out this is sort of backtracking a little bit. I, I think the letter is a is a good idea, but I wonder if it's possible to um, either get some of the key people who would be involved in in these processes uh, to attend a meeting, a, a diversion subcommittee meeting so that we can sort of talk them through what this ask is. They get a letter, they may have questions. It's not a dialogue. It may look intimidating. Oh my goodness, these people, are, what do they want from me and why do they want it? As opposed to actually hearing someone explain, look, we're not coming for you. We just want to, you know, have a better idea of what's happening in diversion and make sure that we maximize, um, you know, the, the opportunities that folks have. 
and or if, if folks aren't or can't, uh, they aren't willing or can't come to these meetings if, um, you know, there, there is some space uh, perhaps among these programs where that conversation can at least start. Um, not opposed to a letter. I just, you know, I, I don't, we could maybe take time to draft like a letter or this could be as easy as, you know, having a real time conversation with folks who would be directly involved and saying, hey, we're looking for this information, not because we're coming for your throat, but because we want to, you know, make, um, you know, we want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to use diversion. And so we need to know who's succeeding, who's failing, if the folks who are failing out need some some different support, and we can make those recommendations once we have the info. So to your earlier point, Chris, you know, um, I think that probably only makes sense if they actually have something to give us, right? If they need clarity, because they need to pull, um, you know, I, I want to make sure I give you this and not that, right? But if they don't have this or that, <laughs> then, you know, you're kind of in a, you know, uh, I don't know if it, that, that necessarily makes sense. I don't know who has what, um, and I don't know where you go from there, but um, you know, I think that's the only caveat, right? Yeah, and I don't know, I mean, I don't even know if any of us have, you know, relationships with all of these groups to have that kind of in-person ask. It would still be either a, a blind phone call saying, hey, you want to come to our meeting or, uh, a letter again to to ask them to attend. Yep. yep. Let, letter is fine. Just just throwing out another option for folks to consider. But yeah, there's there's absolutely no issue with with doing a letter. Just just ask. Yeah. Well, I think that some of us do have relationships, and actually, some of us are the holders of the information. Like you know, we have through RPAL, I could get that information pretty easily. Um, Stephanie with RISE, I'm sure, could also get the information pretty easily. Melvin with probation, I'm hoping, can still can get that information pretty easily. So I think that we will, no matter what, have, you know, some information to go on. Yeah, and I think from, from probation standpoint, again, not to, to sort of belabor the, the point of diversion understanding the is is it a program that a person is going through or is it something where we're just having them complete an apology letter um so those i think are the things that really have to to weigh what specific program sort of and i'll just use rise of saying hey rise has a diversion program where they have to complete you know, 30, 60, 90 days, then getting the data and taking a look, whereas from probation's thing, it's, hey, I need you to go take this class on a Saturday. Uh, and, and, you know, they'll call us and say, hey, yeah, they showed up. It's all good. So I think it's really trying to figure out what the, what the ask is and what specific data is it, you know, from probation standpoint, did they just go and show up and complete? Did we send the referral over to the DA? Did we not? Um, so I guess it really just starts with identifying specific places that focus their attention on a diversion program. So, so interestingly, the, where the definition like really comes live, right? Because the first like line of the definition is diversion is defined as an array of formal and informal practices. Right, so it's not necessarily a, a program per se, right? But I think that that's that's what the, the line has to get drawn is is you know are we just talking about diversion programs or are we talking about um, something else, right? Because I, I think that's the question. Because if we are just talking about programs, um, I think it's very unlikely that an informal practice is gonna you're gonna have data on the informal practices, right? I mean that's the whole idea of being informal. Right. So, um, but sorry, Steph, I know you were okay. jumping. Oh, no, no, no worries. Um, I think one thing, though, that could be helpful from the probation end would be um, like, how often are you referring? Like, and what are those referrals for? So the young people that are coming in, what are those charges that they're being charged for that you're actually referring? Um, that could be helpful information. Sure. Yeah, I don't, I don't know if you all are tracking that, but 
Yeah, I mean, that, but that's something, again, when you're looking at entry points, that starts with local law enforcement. They're making the arrest, uh, uh, and they're determining what they're sending the charges over to us for. And then we'll get it, and then we send it over to the DA, and then the DA ultimately has the filing decision on if that person's going to end up in the system or not. Right, but the ones that you're just referring to a class on Saturday, though, those aren't going to the DA, right? Uh, those could go to the DA, depending on what the outcome of that referral was, on what the outcome of what we asked them to do. So if we send them to a Saturday class and they say, hey, I'm not doing your Saturday class. Okay, we tried. We're going to send it over to the DA. Then the mm -hmm. DA takes a look and they decide based on the information provided if they're going to file. So, I mean, that still would be helpful information um, to find out, like, if you have made a referral, that referral didn't actually happen for whatever reason. So that would still be helpful information. Okay. Even though you're not actually running a program, but you're still making referrals out at some point. But also keeping in mind that probation, we don't do diversion. Right, but you're making referrals for something. So it is an infor informal kind of diversion practice. If, if I could just add, um, and Dante, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think we sent over the amount of referrals we had made to the different uh, agencies several months ago. Sorry, I, I was on mute, talking on mute. My apologies. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if we collected data. I know that. Um, that that we said that we weren't able to get any information from the agencies. Um, I don't know. I don't, I don't know if we collected the data on, on what we sent though. We definitely gave the policies. So in terms of like the types of um, um, law violations, like you know that you know that was kind of in the policy and then, you know when you had, when you were eligible. Um, but I don't know if we had actual numbers though. Yeah, I think it was just all part of the email that we had sent when we looked when we took a look back at um, I think it was March or maybe a little before there were 12 to 15 cases that we sent over for cops, which was a Saturday class uh, and then trying to get the information, them not being responsive. So it's not a huge number of referrals that we actually send over to cops. And then the one that we have for Start Smart, I want to say it might have been maybe between five and seven cases that were sent um, over. So a lot of our stuff, when we're yes, when we are looking at informal, uh, more of hey, apology letter for this, or hey, restitution is uh, uh, this amount. You know, you have to pay restitution um, in, in in that sense. And so I guess it's you know just getting back to you know, some of the diversion uh, programs. And I know the, the rise in the DA sort of program is, is still um, still getting cases, but has there, how many cases have you guys serviced so far, Steph? Do you, do you know? Um, right now, I think we have 13 cases. Okay. Has anybody completed or is it yeah, um, one has completed so far, and then everyone else is in the process. Yes, yeah, so I guess what, you know, what, and what we started, I mean, because since we don't have a case management system, the supervisor has a spreadsheet of all the cases that are coming in um, and, and what we're doing. Um, you know, with them. And like I said, when we provided that the last time, it was a very small number and we can continue to sort of gather, um, gather that, but reporting out that monthly would just, in my opinion, not really make a whole lot of sense if we've had 15 over the last maybe eight to nine months, you know, what we would really be looking at on a monthly basis.
And I would just add to Chris's point earlier um, about um, casting the net too wide and some of the uh, unintended consequences that in most cases, unless there's a victim or restitution or a nexus to sending them out to a uh, partner to have some type of service provided, um, we'll close an intake because we don't want to set something up where the kid has to take 12 classes and it runs into some type of barrier class six and can't complete it. And then it forces our hands saying, oh, he didn't do it. So we'll just look at the whole totality of the situation, the nexus of what treatment would be most appropriate. And if it's something we can just counsel and provide, you know, something to the family or provide something to the youth, we'll close out that intake um, to prevent what Chris was talking about, widening of the net and all the, you know, consequences that we don't want to look downstream at. So um, again, I thought we provided that and it was maybe a hundred cases we closed and 30 referred here and we've sent over maybe 30 to the DA's office, but I could be confusing my meetings, but I'm pretty sure it was this one. Then you did, you did provide uh, what Mel was talking about, which was there were 11, like in 2020, there were like 11 uh, cops cases and, you know, three or four start smarts. It was something like that. You know, I think that that was the information that, um, you know, so that information, yeah, I don't know if we got into the, into the details of, you know, who got, how many got referred, how many didn't get referred. I don't remember that level. I remember, as, as Mel said, he, <clears throat> you know, we, we referred these number of cases, we reached out to them and they said they don't have any data on, on those particular cases, so. So I guess one of the next steps can be those of us that do have the information. Um, send it in so that it can be included into the next meeting. Um, those of us that have relationships with some of the other providers on the list, maybe do a reach out um, and also still work on a letter to send out to the other providers to see if we could gather the additional information. So Madam Chair, I, I took a, a few notes here. Maybe I can share this with um, uh, with all the members, but and, and Chris can tell me if I'm missing something. But what I have down here is um, the information that we're looking for. And then I had it a little bit on the end. But what are what are the costs? Or are there any fees or anything like that? Um, what does success look like? Uh, data on who enrolled, those who completed versus who, those who didn't, and if possible, you know, reasons for you know the unsuccessful. Um, completions and then you know, what I added on is I'm assuming we kind of want this disaggregated by race and gender if possible. Thank you Dante. Can you send that out to us? I, I will. I will. I'll send it out after the meeting. I'll send it out to, uh, to all the members so that they have it. Okay. All right, so we're still on number five. Um, is there any additional information that we should be discussing under this topic? I think we have, I think where we're going is we, we wanna cl collect the additional data to evaluate so that we can start looking at recommendations. So, so maybe what I would ask Madam Chair, um, I know um, one of your members, Robin Lepetsky, is not here, and, and I know that she was going to do some um, digging on uh, some of the court-based diversion and so some of um, looking at some of the statutory diversion and that aren't utilized and what it would take to potentially get them utilized. So I only bring all this up to say, is there, um, you know, as everyone's going out and kind of getting information, is there any information that we might want to share with her or some some list we might want to ask her to complete for, for next meeting as well. I can reach out to her. Um, once I get your email about the points that we're going to be looking for, I can reach out to her and ask her to also provide the information. Excellent. All right.
right. So I think, uh, well, I can open it up for public comment. I'm not hearing any or seeing any hands or chats. Next steps, and we kind of already talked about next steps. Are there any additional next steps we should be discussing? Any of those? A lot going on somewhere. Well, I mean, I, I guess the last thing on our agenda is to adjourn to the next subcommittee meeting. I think we have a um, quarterly meeting, so we'll see each other then before we see each other on the diversion, um, our next diversion meeting. Anything else? Any closing remarks from anyone? I appreciate everyone's time. Have Thank a good you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Adjourn 426.